Thank you so much for checking out today's video. We want to let you know that you can suggest cases on our website, criminallylisted.com. Besides suggesting cases for Criminally Listed, you can also suggest cases for our podcast, Into the Killing, and our other channel, Paranormally Listed. In today's video, we'll discuss the cases of three men who committed horrifying crimes, and today, they are walking the streets. But before we start, I want to talk about a serious crime plague that is sweeping America, and that's identity theft. One of the best tools to protect yourself and your family is today's sponsor, Aura. As someone who covers true crime, I was shocked to learn that the fastest growing crime in America is identity theft. Someone has their identity stolen every 14 seconds. I remember a few years ago, my grandmother got caught up in an identity theft scam on email. It made me so angry because my grandmother was a wonderful and kind woman who taught kindergarten for over 30 years. She usually just used her email to contact her grandkids who were scattered throughout the world. Then, some jerk tried to steal the money she spent a lifetime working for. We were lucky because the bank notified one of my relatives and they stopped it before my grandmother lost too much money. This happened years ago and I still tremble with anger when I think about it. Because of that experience, I'm thankful for today's sponsor, Aura. Aura is identity theft protection, fraud monitoring, a VPN, password management, and antivirus software rolled into one easy-to-use app. You may have one of these services already, but having all these tools is very important. After all, you wouldn't want a toolbox with just a hammer, would you? Can you even imagine what it'd be like to get onto your email one day and find out that someone had changed your password hours ago? Then you start getting notifications that someone's applying for credit cards in your name or trying to access your bank account or opening crypto accounts in your name. These are just a few of the horrifying things that could happen to you if someone steals your identity. But thankfully, Aura monitors the dark web for your emails, passwords, and security numbers, then sends alerts to your phone and email. I was nervous, but I decided to scan the dark web to see how many times my login credentials were found on the dark web. Turned out that my email address was on it four times, and my password was on it six times. Although I was nervous about doing it, I'm thankful I've checked. I'll be sure to use Aura in the future, because they'll send me near real-time alerts on suspicious credit inquiries. So, I'll know if someone tries to open a credit card in my name, for example. Plus, I'll stay anonymous while I'm online with their powerful VPN. Protect your family and yourself from identity theft at Aura.com slash listed, or click on the link below the description. And if you sign up right now, Aura will give you a two-week free trial with my link so you can see for yourself how many times Aura finds your family member's personal info on the dark web. You won't regret checking. Help support Criminally Listed and stay safe online by checking out Aura.com slash Criminally Listed. Number 3. Kyle Hedquist On November 27, 1994, a man was riding his horse on an abandoned logging road in Roseburg, Oregon. He came across the body of a young woman. She was identified as 19-year-old Nikki Thrasher, who lived in nearby Winston, Oregon. She had been missing for about two days. The police talked to Thrasher's friends, and this led them to 18-year-old Kyle Hedquist. Hedquist was a friend of Thrasher's roommate's boyfriend. The police questioned Hedquist, and he confessed to the murder. Hedquist said that he and his friend had committed several burglaries. They had unknowingly robbed Thrasher's aunt. He thought the Thrasher recognized some of the stolen items and he was worried she would turn him into the police. So he tricked her into driving out to the rural location. Then when her back was turned, he shot her execution style in the back of the head. Hedquist admitted that he didn't know for sure that Thrasher suspected that the items were stolen from her aunt's home. He just thought she might have known. Hedquist wasn't finished confessing. Weeks before the murder, on October 9th, 1994, he went to a pizza restaurant in Roseburg just after closing. He was armed with a handgun and he was wearing a ski mask. He rounded up three staff members and one of their brothers. The brother was there to pick up the employee. Hedquist demanded the money, but it was on the safe. The safe had a timer on it, so it couldn't be opened until 20 minutes after it was unlocked. 
so Edquist took the employees to the party room and bound them. When he went to get the money, one of the employees, a 17-year-old boy, was able to free himself. He took off running, and Hedquist saw him. He fired two shots at the young man's head, but missed. Then Hedquist ran from the store. He got away with about $3,000. After confessing, Hedquist was charged with aggravated murder. In November 1995, 19-year-old Kyle Hedquist pleaded guilty to aggravated murder. He was sentenced to life without the chance of parole. So it looked like he was going to die in prison. But then, in April 2022, 27 years after the murder, Oregon's governor, Kate Brown, granted Kyle Hedquist clemency as part of a progressive stance of criminal justice. 45-year-old Hedquist was officially released on April 14, 2022. According to the governor's office, he was sent to live with a man who was a former parole officer, probation officer, and a retired chaplain. The man had served in the Department of Corrections and Community Corrections for decades. The governor's office did not publicly announce that Hedquist received clemency before he was released, nor did they notify the Sheriff's Department or Nikki Thrasher's family. The Sheriff's Department and Nikki Thrasher's family, along with many people in the public, were very critical of Hedquist being granted clemency. They pointed out that Hedquist had plotted and committed the cold-blooded murder of a teenage girl. They believe he is still dangerous. The governor's office released a statement explaining why Hedquist was granted clemency. They pointed out he was just 18 and in high school when the murder was committed. He also did a lot in prison to rehabilitate himself. For over 20 years, he volunteered in hospice care and mentored other prisoners. He also took accountability for his actions and has shown remorse. Nevertheless, many people felt that the governor's actions show that criminals are being prioritized over victims and their families. Number 2. Kevin Kohler In August 1985, 17-year-old Helen Wadham lived in the small town of Belgrave, Ontario. Belgrave is about 120 miles east of Toronto. Although just 17, Wadham was the mother of two. She had a 13-month-old daughter and a 2-month-old son. August 3, 1985 was her wedding day. That afternoon, before the ceremony, there was a rehearsal. After the rehearsal, Wadham got into the car that was being driven by her 20-year-old future brother-in-law, Kevin Kohler. Also in the car were Wadham's 12-year-old cousin, Tammy Downey, and one of her bridesmaids, 16-year-old Christine Lindsay. After they left the rehearsal, Kohler was speeding and caught the attention of a police officer. The officer tried to pull him over, but Kohler didn't stop. Other officers joined in the pursuit. Kohler led them on a 30-mile high-speed chase. Then suddenly, Kohler came upon a blind spot on the highway between Walkerton and Gincardin, two small towns in Ontario. In the blind spot, 24-year-old Ontario Provincial Police Officer Donald Campbell was doing a U-turn to join the chase. In the car with him was 28-year-old Constable William O'Sullivan. Kohler's car collided with the police cruiser. The cruiser then caught fire. O'Sullivan was pulled from the car and taken to the hospital. 20-year-old Kevin Kohler and 12-year-old Tammy Downey were also taken to the hospital. All three survived their injuries. Tragically, 24-year-old Donald Campbell, 17-year-old Helen Wadham, and 16-year-old Christine Lindsay were all killed. At the time, the police were criticized for getting involved in a dangerous police chase. Kohler was being pursued because he didn't pull over after he was caught speeding. It wasn't like he was a known dangerous criminal who desperately needed to be stopped at that moment. 
Nevertheless, Kohler was arrested and charged with criminal negligence causing death and criminal negligence causing bodily harm. In December 1985, he pleaded guilty to both charges. He was sentenced to three years in prison and he was banned from driving for life. Kohler served his sentence and he was released. In September 2014, Kevin Kohler was living in Kitchener, Ontario with a 55-year-old roommate, Marianne May. May was divorced and didn't have any children. In the fall of 2014, she was dating a man. May had worked as a cook at a long-term care facility, but she had recently gotten a job at a landscaping company. She was looking forward to starting the job because she'd be able to move out of the apartment she shared with Kohler. May had told her boyfriend that someone at the apartment physically abused her. She was also sick of Kohler's constant partying. Another problem was that Kohler's girlfriend had recently moved in. On the night of September 18th, 2013, Marianne May returned home and Kohler and his girlfriend were partying and playing loud music. May went into her bedroom and locked the door. She called and texted her landlord several times. The landlord suggested she contact the police. Then suddenly, the landlord stopped hearing from her. Two days later, on September 20th, 2013, a man was walking his dog along the river near Kohler and May's apartment. He found the dead body of 55-year-old Marianne May. The police did an investigation. In March 2014, 49-year-old Kevin Kohler was arrested and charged with second-degree murder. A year later, in March 2015, Kohler pleaded guilty to manslaughter. He said he just wanted to scare May when he entered her room. He started strangling her, and then the next thing he knew, she was dead. He then wrapped her body in some blankets and then loaded it into a children's bicycle trailer. He brought the body to the river and then dumped it on the riverside. After pleading guilty, Kevin Kohler was sentenced to 12 years of prison. He had been in prison since his arrest a year earlier, so he only had 11 years left to serve. But then, in April 2022, he was released on statutory parole eight years into his sentence. He was paroled because he had served two-thirds of his sentence, which is common in Canada. However, many people were upset because in 28 years, Kohler was responsible for the deaths of four people, including two teenage girls, one who was a mother who was killed on her wedding day, plus a police officer. He also strangled a woman to death with his bare hands. But he had only served, at most, 11 years of prison. Also, according to a Parole Board of Canada report, Kohler is still potentially dangerous, especially to women he might be in a relationship with. In total, including the charges stemming from the deaths he's caused, he has 38 criminal convictions on his record. This includes 5 counts of assault, 6 counts of assaulting a peace officer, and assault with a weapon. Yet, he was still released to the public. It's unknown where Kevin Kohler is living upon his release. Number 1. Eric Smith In August 1993, 4-year-old Derek Robbie, who lived in the small town of Savona, New York, was attending a summer camp at a park just down the road from his house. On the morning of August 2nd, Derek was supposed to walk to the park alone. Around 11 a.m., his mother went to the park to pick him up. She was horrified to learn that he didn't arrive at camp that day. The area was searched, and Derek's body was found less than 100 yards from his home. He had been strangled, beaten in the head and the chest with rocks, and sodomized with a stick. The police launched a massive investigation which included interviewing kids who were at the summer camp. This included 13-year-old Eric Smith. 
Eric was a bullied loner who loved his bicycle. On August 8th, six days after the murder, Eric told his family that he had killed Derek. The same day, Eric's family brought him to the police station and he confessed to the police. Eric said that he happened upon Derek as he was walking to the park. He told Derek there was a shortcut through the woods and they should take it. Once they were in the wooded area, Eric said he walked up behind the little boy and strangled him until he lost consciousness. He then hit him in the head three times with a small rock. He found a bigger rock and dropped it on his head three times. After that, Eric dropped another big rock on Derek's chest. Eric then sodomized Derek with a stick to see if he was still alive. According to New York's juvenile laws, children as young as 13 can be charged as an adult with murder. So the day after Eric confessed, he was charged as an adult with murder. 14-year-old Eric Smith went to trial in August 1994, a year after the murder. Eric's defense lawyers argued that he had severe mental problems, including intermittent explosive disorder. This caused him to act erratically and violently. The trial lasted about two weeks, and then the jury deliberated for 10 hours. 14-year-old Eric Smith was found guilty of second-degree murder. He was sentenced to nine years to life in prison. He spent three years in a juvenile facility. He then served four years in prison for young adults. In 2001, he was transferred to a maximum security prison. At some point, he was moved to a medium security prison. In 2002, Eric applied for parole for the first time. He was denied. He continued to apply for parole every two years, and he was denied each time. He was denied because it was believed that he was still a danger to society, and Derek Robbie's parents opposed his release. Eric said that he should be released because he would be a good counselor for bullied kids so they don't make the same mistake as he did. He said he would return to Savona if he was released. In 2021, Eric applied for parole for the 11th time. In October 2021, he was granted parole after serving 27 years in prison. He was supposed to be released on November 17, 2021, but he didn't have appropriate housing. So he was released on February 1, 2022. At the time of this recording, he is living in Queens, New York. Eric Smith will be on parole for the rest of his life. Thank you so much for watching today's video. Please don't forget to check out our new channel, Paranormally Listed. There's a link on the screen now, and there's a link in the description box below this video. Well, that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.